Hello, welcome to the Learn Live Music Podcast. My guest today is Simon Francis. How's it going, Si? Going well, thanks. How are you? I'm good. Thanks good. so much for doing this, oh, man. Thanks for having me. So I just want to give people a little bit of context about you and the things you've done. So you're a bass player, sound designer. I know I've seen you playing bass with Ellie Golding, with Kylie Minogue, The Pierces, Exit Kid, mm -hmm. Becky Hill. And you've also worked on sound design and pre-production with Bastille, Mumford & Sons, Sigrid. Who did I leave out? <laughs> Let's throw a few more in I there. I think that's probably <laughs> most of it. Um... We've known each other for a while. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, not, yeah. I think that's probably the guts of it. There's probably a few other bits and pieces, but those are definitely the headlines. So most people who know you would be probably with your work with Ellie Golding because it was quite a few years you were there yeah, as a that, touring bass player. Yeah, that would have been the best part of like eight eight years, I think. Really? So again, there might even be people who haven't heard of Ellie Golding mm -hmm. in some parts of the world. Yeah. So <laughs> give us a bit of context for that. What kind of give gigs were you doing what were the level of the tours uh, were there some key festivals you did tv that kind of thing yeah with ellie i i got involved with her i started playing with her on at the beginning of her second album campaign back in 2012 maybe um and i guess at that point it was sort of academy level so like brixton academy would have been like the big london show and then over the course of the time, it sort of went from that. And the, the, the last live gig I did with her was Rock in Rio in 2019, which was like 120,000 people. That's so, a few. Yes, a few. <laughs> um, and then so and pretty much like between those things, sort of at every size venue from that to that. So like and and kind of multiple nights at the O2 Arena. Um, got to do like Red Rocks and Coachella and Glastonbury. I mean, like t ticked off a lot of kind of big, big tick list venues and things to do. So um, yeah, like it was an amazing, a really amazing run and amazing to be sort of involved with it at such a, at like a time really like I came on where I got to avoid a lot of the hard work of starting out with the new artists. So there was some success there already, which meant there was uh, a lot of energy and a lot of the, kind of industrial and the label machine sort of thing was behind her and putting their way into it. So um, it was, looking back now, it was a very fortunate time to have quite a comfortable experience of touring at that level because I'd not done anything quite at that that level before. I'd had like brief trips on tour buses, but, but not like living on them sort of thing. So really? All right. Yeah. Wow, so a real, <laughs> yeah, and then straight into eight years of that, you yeah. know, literally covering the world. So tell us a little bit more about your role there in the band, like live bass player, but flesh that out for us a little bit. Like what does that involve, especially over that sort of period? Yeah, so I, yeah, I played bass and then a bit of keys and then towards the end, a little bit of guitar as well. Um, but yeah, on bass, it was, when I sort of was brought on, I had been playing around in, in kind of projects of my own and in other things of using a lot of effects on bass. And so a, a large part of my role with Ellie was sort of that, uh, um, I guess like approaching the synth sounds that were on her record, especially that second album. And before that really, her association with EDM and, and I guess it was all around the time of Skrillex and that sort of big kind of dubstep movement that was happening. Um, so a lot of electronic sounds and Joe Clegg, her musical director and our mutual friend um, was really keen to look at ways of staying true to that sonic aesthetic and world and sound. But I think he'd struggled with the rhythm section feeling the way that he wanted to. So I had a lot of opportunity to make the bass sound like a synth. Um, and that was definitely a big part of that, as well as playing synth when it made sense to do and yeah, that sort of grew as time went on. I also did a bit of work with Joe on kind of the programming side of things. Um, and that was sort of the beginning of, of a relationship that we've then had, that, that we've then taken to other gigs with Sigrid and Mumford and & Sons and Bastille. Um, and yeah, so it was sort of, it was really kind of trying to find ways of exploiting the technology and the musicianship that we all had. And yeah, so it was kind of ba bass player, but it, I think we 
we were a tight knit team of musicians at that time as well. And we're all sort of, you know, young and ambitious. And I think really kind of pushing each other to uh, kind of explore the limits of what that could look like on a pop gig, I guess. Yeah, it sounds like a, a really good team. It's, yeah. it's interesting that the scope for that, like even within a pop gig, does mm. that, where does that come from? Does that come from the artist? Does that come from the music director, management? I think it's, it's probably, it's probably a bit of all of them. Like I think some of that is like an environment, I think that fosters that. And it, it maybe can be started by someone. Certainly with, with Ellie Golding, that seemed to be something that everyone was open to. Um, it seemed to be, I guess when I came on, that was definitely very much driven by Joe. Um, but Ellie was excited about that sort of stuff and management and and sort of the wider team. It definitely seemed to be something that they appreciated. And e even, I guess, like TV bookers and and like the promoters and, and definitely that, that side of it, you know, as time went on and we developed relationships with them, some of the feedback we'd have got from them was um, an excitement about the stuff that we were doing. So I guess there was a lot of encouragement and motivation externally and from other things but the key drive to that in lots of ways really was the musicians I think um, but we were released into that and had the permission which is definitely I've you know I've definitely done other things where it's much more the expectation is you fill in a much more standard role or sort of like I, I wouldn't say paint by numbers because I feel like that sounds derogatory but it, you know, and other things, it is just a case of like, no, when you play bass, it'll be bass. And when you play drums, it'll be drums. If there's electronics, you know, maybe they're on track or, you know, if there's a synth part, just play it on the synth. And and again, sometimes that can be about a creative aesthetic as well. Um, so it's sort of like, I, don't, I guess I don't know. <laughs> yeah, some of the but, choices, um, I guess, are stylistic yeah. and rather than good and bad, but... I mean, it certainly resonates with me anyway. Like yeah. As a listener, the the live nature and and just bringing in more creativity and different palettes and different textures into. Yeah, things. I think we we were keen for things to be as live as possible, and and also, while being as true to the recorded material, um, like again, like at, at the time, it felt like a lot of gigs seemed like they were being forced into making a choice between. Um, either being kind of heavily reliant on backing track or or having a massive band with a lot of musicians or which budgets just don't always allow for or the other option was then maybe to rearrange things and and do it in a in a live way so I think we were sort of keen to find a through line that I guess in some ways took in parts of all of that and and found a way of injecting a live energy but while, yeah I think while staying true to to the recorded material and and that sort of then I guess that's been a thread then through all of the work that I've done um, and certainly then more more on the kind of programming and sound design side of things that's very much been led from I guess developing a reputation and a track record of delivering live shows that that I guess tread that line of, of finding live energy but being kind of true or at least sort of um, representative of a production aesthetic and a, and a musical style that exists on the like recorded material. It's interesting how you're not just playing bass guitar, but um, playing synth, mm. playing a six string guitar, maybe playing upright, sound design, yeah. programming. Have those skills been important to you in your career in like the, the kind of jobs that you've had? And c can you see how that's important or do you think it's just how it's happened, you know, people can just stick on the guitar yeah. or what's your thoughts on it for yourself and have you seen that with, with other people? Should people like broaden out, develop these other skills? Is that helpful? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I can only speak from my experience, but for me, that stuff's been invaluable. Um, I think adding, adding a skill is only ever positive. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, like I can't, I don't play upright bass super well, but I play it well enough. And uh, like I sort of started masquerading as an upright bass player at the time that there was sort of that kind of indie folk revival that 
was spearheaded by a communion scene and Mumford and Sons and all of that stuff. So there was, even at that time, there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of need for that and being able to sort of find my way around it a little. And then, you know, I then had the opportunities to develop that and get better. Um, and if I hadn't have been able to, to play that, um, those opportunities wouldn't have happened. And yeah, like I think definitely for me, it's been, I think that largely that's what my reputation is probably based on. And I think a large part of what I'm booked for is that, um, not that I'm not, I, you know, I think I'm not sure I'm necessarily like a bass player first in some ways. I think that's the role that I play, but I think the context of my perspective from that is probably wider and maybe is more from like, a traditionally sort of like I guess like a producer's ear or certainly what I hear is is more that and so whatever instrument I guess whether that's bass or guitar is sort of a tool in realizing that um but yeah I mean bass guitar happens to be the one that I think I have the as an instrument I have a real strong affin affinity with it um it's probably where most of my like I guess ability as a musician exists most on that instrument. And I'm also really good at making it not sound <laughs> like a bass. So I, I, you know, I can sort of, it's an instrument that I can kind of take with me anywhere I need to go. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's been helpful, but yeah, I mean, in terms of like, if you can learn new skills, if you can learn new instruments, whether that's backing vocals, whether that is having familiarity with DAWs and various kind of software environments, um, synthesizers, just even basic sound design. It can be sh be a real asset and all that is ever going to do is open up more opportunities for you. It's certainly not going to be a limiting factor. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I guess sound design is a fundamental thing anyway. Like even yeah. if, say you're a drummer, which drums do you select? How do you tune them if you're a guitar player? Which guitar, your tone, you, you yeah. know? So uh, being able to develop that and, and use these tools that exist, that makes sense. You've talked quite a bit about your um, aesthetic. Mm. And I think that's really interesting that there's an element where you're recognizing yourself that people identify your aesthetic and they know Cy Francis does this certain thing. Mm. Where, where did that come from? <laughs> and can you tell us a little bit about, you, you know, your love for effects pedals and, yeah. and how that sort of played out? Um, yeah, I mean, like the focus on aesthetic came, it was probably, I was maybe 20, 21, um, and was beginning to, I mean, it had been from, from kind of finishing school and from 18, I'd been playing in bands and, um, and I'd started to kind of explore, I guess, work as a session musician and it started to be booked for like the odd live gig and the odd recording session in London. And yeah, like early 20s, I was booked for a session and I had just bought a a new bass and it was the bass that I thought that you needed to have as a session musician. It was a five string Sadowski active jazz bass. Right. And, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and in my head, I was like, oh, this is the bass that, you know, this is the session bass and I will take this. To, I'll do every gig with this one bass. But my collection sort of before that had been... And still was, I hadn't, I hadn't sold anything to get that bass. I'd saved up for it. But I'd had like Dan Electros and um, just slightly odd, kind of old 60s hollow bodies. And, and at the time, things that were actually cheap. And um, But it, it fitted sort of a sound that I'd been drawn to. But I got booked for a recording session and I had just took the Sadowski and I remember arriving and opening it. And the, and the producer was just like, what the fuck is that? And and it, and like, I did the session. Um, luckily, they had sort of something weird there, but the producer was just kind of like, you know, when I call you, what I associate you with is this, this, and this. And and I'd been I'd been using effects pedals, kind of always. Like I think I got a bass, and then maybe within a month of having the bass guitar, I got like a Zoom multi effects pedal. And I just was, I just always used that. So I think it, it never really, I never really seemed like something that you wouldn't do. It was just kind of, it was there. Um, and I had a fascination with sound and like my dad played keys. So I guess even that like, you know, my dad had like a, a Korg M1, which obviously can sound like a lot of different things and arguably maybe not so well, 
but um I guess I was used to an instrument being able to make lots of different sounds. So being able to see that with bass, I think for me just always felt intuitive and part of it. Um, and so it turned out that I guess that was a thing that that producer sort of identified as being like, you know, you'll bring sort of wild cards or you'll bring um, strange sounds to things, whether that's distortion or maybe something a bit more exotic. And I think, I guess ultimately that must have resonated with something in me. And I think in that I identified some truth to that notion of that maybe being um, what I guess where like I was drawn to with my ear. Um, and I guess now like looking back and like, I, I guess I discovered a niche maybe. Um, but at the time I didn't, I wasn't really thinking of it like that. And, and I, it was, I guess it was like early days of beginning a career and I was doing a lot of gigs, maybe playing stuff that I didn't really like playing, um, which for the most part was fine because I, I just like playing. So like I, I always was sort of like any opportunity to play is great, but there was a bit where I felt this pressure to maybe need to be like a chameleon, which can be great for some people, but for me just never really fitted great. And so I think having someone kind of be like, almost sort of reject my attempts to do that. It kind of empowered me to then go, well, I guess I need to lean back in to the stuff that I want to do. And I mean, I pretty much immediately sold that Sadowski and bought like a small kind of 30 watt tube amp and, uh, and a Gibson grabber. And then <laughs> that, that became the Gibson grabber for a really long time was like the base that I just took to kind of every gig I did. Um, and yeah, I think it was, I think for me that was really helpful because I guess like now I've spoken to other people who talk about like the importance of maybe like a personal brand or there being something and, and, and whether that's maybe right for other people, certainly for me, that meant that really quickly early on, I think there was something that I was easily identified by. And so if there was that sort of shaped hole on a gig, it was like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll book Simon. And then I think that, that sort of seems to be what happened. So, it, yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's always it's always difficult to kind of untangle whether that stuff is happenstance or how much intention was behind it because a lot of the time it feels kind of intuitive. And I think for me, it was just a case of following things that I guess resonated or felt like they rang true with me or brought joy. Even like you know, it's kind of just simply chasing that. I guess that's very cool. I think. As musicians, we maybe don't like this notion of like the personal brand or whatever. Mm. I mean, some people do nowadays. There's some people are more like entrepreneurial, hustling. But I feel like in general, we we gravitate to something more authentic. But mm. the whole point of that is if you if you take away that language of personal brand, which is quite corporate, yeah, it's it's being yourself. Like when you know your friends, you know what they're yeah. like, you know their personality, who you like to hang out with. And similarly to work with people, people are good to work with and you know what they'll bring to the table. So by following your interest and yeah. just sharing that, people now associate you with being able to offer something. Yeah, and and, and I think for me, what that was, I guess, authenticity. Like it was about actually that thing that became, I think, you know, unknowingly to me then became a, something that I was associated with and that just happened to be the thing that I love to do. And, and, I, and, and I invested so much time into it that I think naturally it became something that I was good at, which was sort of, a, is then a win-win because it's not like I'm not being booked to do some sort of bossa nova gig or like, you know, like something that like I'm then, and, and, I've, and I've done things like that in the past where you're totally in the deep end and it's great to sort of say yes to every opportunity and see what comes of it. But there are definitely times where you know deep down that you're, a fraud in the thing and it's just not an enjoyable when you're really at that that sort of like beyond the edge of where your capability is and um it's not fun <laughs> and and it and i think it so it's easier to just kind of focus on what you're good at i i heard someone kind of say once that you know you're you're actually this notion that you can have of like you need to work on your weaknesses it's like actually you'll achieve more if you work on your strengths and so I, I, I think that's very much been what I've done. And, and maybe that's been to my detriment in some ways, but for the most part, it means I get to 
I've been able to build a career doing things that I really, really enjoy doing. Um, and almost any time anyone contacts me about working with something, it's always to do something that I really want to do. So, um, yeah, it's been great. Um, yeah. Yeah, very cool. I just wanted to talk finally a little bit about the pre-production side and other mm. aspects of being involved in live music, except for performing, you know, yeah. and playing on stage. And we've talked a lot about, you know, sound design and that aspect, but could you tell us a little bit about maybe the skills are involved and how mm. you approach if you're doing pre-production sound design for a gig? What What's your attitude? What's your approach? What sort of the key skills for someone who wants to, to do that kind of thing? Yeah, uh, I mean, essentially, I guess now, certainly within within the the arenas that I'm working in, it's almost exclusively using Ableton Live as the DAW. So having familiarity with that and the architecture and the workflow is kind of a must. Certainly for me, and in terms of achieving the sort of shows that I've been a part of building, that's a really important piece of software to kind of help deliver on that. Um, so yeah, for me, kind of, learning that understanding it um and that doesn't necessarily mean to be all of it but definitely have an awareness of all the different instruments and the different audio effects and the midi and routing co like capabilities of it um and then beyond that really it's understanding basic kind of signal flow of, of things like synthesizers and understanding how you can exploit each section so things that can be really helpful with that and, and maybe maybe buying a software synth or exploring the stuff that you have maybe in GarageBand or that you would get with something like Ableton. I mean, even like, I think Ableton will do like a, a free, I think there's like a free light version or certainly versions that are bundled with software. Or if you can afford it by, by like a small analog synth, um, things like if you can find like an old Novation base station or even things like the Behringer Moog kind of Model D Thing. A lot of those synths are kind of the, I guess the kind of graphical layout of the user interface is often in the direction of the signal flow. So it'll begin with your oscillators, move to your mixer section, move to the filters. And so intuitively you start to get a feel for how everything interacts and how it works. And really that that's kind of the, the building block of that and starting to understand the sounds um, and just listening to a lot of music. And and I guess like being mildly obsessive about music and and gear and equipment and things that people have used, I've always kind of kept at least kind of a loose, almost like sonic dictionary in my head of, of sounds and how they've been made. And that, certainly for me, that's proven really helpful because it's now, and I guess it's, I've had, you know, the best part of a decade now of doing that as a as a focused job so it's become quite intuitive now and it, and it is that thing of and I'm I'm still sort of surprised certainly post pandemic kind of or initial wave of the pandemic because who knows who knows what's to come but um definitely coming out of lockdown and having had kind of a year 18 months of not not doing that the the first gig that I kind of came back to with the programming was with Bastille and and in terms of what they wanted delivered, it really was trying to, at least as an option, have every single recorded synth and keyboard sound available as something that could be played. Um, and some of what was helpful with them is they'd created a very distinct sonic aesthetic and environment for that. And so their touchstones for that were a lot of artists from the 80s and, and like whether that was maybe something like something like Prince or or even kind of things like Lionel Richie or some of the post-punk stuff that happened then, there was that kind of sound. So you know that you're in kind of Lindrum and Juno territory, but it, I guess it's having that knowledge and having that curiosity to then mean that you can draw on that. And then you find, for me anyway, I find that I naturally know like, okay, well then this is the, this is the oscillator that's probably being used there. This is the waveform this will be the sort of filter. But I think in terms of learning those skills, I you really just need to jump in and try it. There's a really good bit of software you can get um, called Centurial, 
which I don't think is too expensive. And it is a like plug-in synth. And it kind of comes packaged with a, like a tutorial thing. So you hands-on are taught different parts of this soft synth. And as part of the kind of practices, they'll maybe black out most of the synth and you'll just have, here's just, all you can control is the waveforms. And that, that can be a really practical way of learning to do that stuff. But if you don't want to do that and you just have some stuff already, even just spend spend some time listening to some records you love and some sounds you like and maybe see if you can get into the ballpark. And at first, it doesn't need to be exact, even if it just sort of evokes a similar feeling or serves. I, like, I feel like I often end up talking about function and in terms of kind of taking recorded music to live sometimes they'll you know you'll there'll be an interpolation of a part so maybe there's an arpeggiated synth thing but live you're like well maybe you're out of keyboard players but you've got a guitarist and and maybe no guitars were recorded on that song so there's maybe a way of the guitarist playing that arpeggiated line on the guitar and there's always going to be some limitation in that sounding exactly like it but it can serve the same purpose whether that's to drive the song forward to provide some energy where does that sit in the frequency range and even all of that stuff even if you're not creating the same sound you're already starting to build a thought process that is thinking about is is the transient is it a quick attack is the release short is it long is the sound bright is it dark what's the envelope of that does the sound maybe start bright and get darker does it start dark and get brighter are there effects? Are there delay? Is there reverb? Is it, is it creating tension? Is it creating drama? Is it creating release? All of that stuff is, even just that sort of awareness, I think really helps. And, and I think even if you're not doing sound design, even if you're not doing programming, even if you're not trying to create sounds for that, it will definitely help you as a musician because you start thinking about the part that you're playing and the role that it has and I guess the function that it's performing in that thing, does it need to, you know, does it need to lock in, I guess, as a bass player? So easily you can fall into that trap of thinking, oh, I just need to play every time the kick drum's there. But actually sometimes you want the bass maybe to create a bit of conflict with that rhythm. So I think it's, if you start being aware of that, even just listening to music, it'll start to change the way you play, I think. Um, and then that stuff that then builds a really good foundation to maybe explore programming sounds out of maybe. <laughs> yeah, man. I think there's so many practical tips there, but I think that critical listening, mm. so like when you're a teenager, you maybe you want to play fast or loud or look like somebody yeah. you know on stage, you get the same guitar, the same clothes or whatever. But that critical listening is what starts to like elevate, you know, yeah. really good musicians and producers and so practical mate thanks mm. so much for sharing all this oh, with us. Pleasure. if people want to find you or connect with you can they find you on the internet somewhere Damn. where are you um i generally on social media on the internet i'm si francis si francis and that's like my handle on instagram probably on twitter though i'm never on twitter um, and i have a website but instagram is probably the best place to keep up with what i'm doing um i'll happily fill your feed with nonsense um and and, and noise you, and fuzz pedals yeah and noise fuzz <laughs> pedals modular synths um yeah kind of anything i'm working on and i'm also if anyone ever wants to kind of reach out to me through any of that stuff i'm always more than happy to 